This video is on endospores and there are basically two important genera that can make endospores and those would be bacillus and clostridium. Now there are other endospore forming microbes for sure but these are the two medically significant ones. They are both gram-positive rods, and when they form endospores and you look at them under a microscope, you um, will see a clear spot where the endospore forms. And so you can put a malachite green stain on there and get them to have this very pretty green endospore. So the endospore can form in the end of the bacterial cell or the middle of it or the other end. So locations could, are considered to be um, terminal, uh, like in Clostridium tetanus, or um, subterminal, like kind of near the end, uh, or central. And the, where they form their endospore, if you're looking at them in the microscope, can be helpful in identifying a species. So you might have narrowed it down, oh, okay, I know this is Clostridium, or I know this is Bacillus. And then um, when it starts to sporulate, then you see where the spores formed, and then that helps you say, oh, it's Bacillus subtilis, or oh, it's Bacillus cereus, etc. So this can be helpful in identification. Okay, so um, an en the word endo means inside, and the word spore indicates that it's something that can turn into um, a full-sized bacterial cell. It's a little bit like a seed, um, but we don't use that word when we talk about it. So we're going to call them endospores, and basically all an endospore contains is the bacterial DNA and ribosomes. And then it has, contains uh, substances to help it uh, stabilize DNA from damage. And then um, some substances that will help it to germinate if the time comes. So these are the ingredients of an endospore. Contain these three things. Let's put that with them. So these are the ingredients. They contain DNA, ribosomes, and something to stabilize their DNA. So that's why they're going to be so resistant. Okay, so let's go down here and look at an example of a bacterial cell that can form endospores. I'm going to make it rod shaped and purple because they usually are gram positive um, rods. And this is the vegetative cell. Okay, so this vegetative cell is doing what you would think a bacterial cell is doing. It's metabolizing things, it's making ATP, and it's dividing. So it has DNA, just like all cells. So here's its circular DNA. I'm not including any plasmids in this particular drawing. Um, there we go, DNA. Okay, so what would make this cell decide uh-oh, we are in trouble, and we had better go into pod mode. Let's make endospores. Kind of like to think of this, if you've ever seen Superman, when Superman's parents are on the planet that is going to be destroyed, and they know they're going to die, but they take their little boy, and they put him in that escape pod, and they shoot him out into space. Of course, he lands on Earth, and 
the rest of the story is well known. Um, but they sacrificed themselves to make sure that down the road they could have um, their DNA basically living on. So imagine the DNA is Superman, the vegetative cell is like Superman's parents, and now they are going to put Superman into um, an escape pod that we will call an endospore. So it turns out that endospore formation is stimulated by stress on the cell. When I read about this, the two things that um, you come across the most are um, going to be that so a lack of food or nutrients. But um, and, and all these things are kind of interrelated. I would also posit that stress would be antibiotic treatment. So this is notable in the treatment of C. diff. Because if someone has Clostridium difficile infection, which is an endospore former, then the antibiotics are starting to basically stress out the vegetative cells, right? So then they're going to form endospores. The problem is the endospores are impervious to antibiotics. And so we could have a reemergence of the infection, which does happen quite frequently. So um, I also put on here uh, the presence of oxygen. This might seem like a funny one, right? You want, would maybe want to say, oh, not enough oxygen. But remember that clostridium, these are all obligate anaerobes, and bacillus, although it can grow in the presence of oxygen, seems to prefer a low oxygen environment for its vegetative cell. Uh, so um, let me give you an example of, of how this might work. Let's say that um, in Clostridium perfringens, which is a disease that could cause gas gangrene, that there is um, a cleaning out of the wound and it's exposed to a lot of oxygen. So now the Clostridium perfringens that was um, living in a vegetative state like this might form endospores and then those endospores might fall onto the ground and then they could be picked up by someone else. So it's a protective mechanism to survive. Um, also, another example could be Bacillus anthracis. So Bacillus anthracis grows inside of cows. Um, it's very famous as a um, like a bioterrorist kind of thing because the endospores could be sent in letters and things like that. But in it, the way it was originally known about was a disease in cows and it would be maybe traveling in the blood of the cow and then when it be gets near the lungs and there's a lot of oxygen there it would form endospores and at that point then um, when the animal dies the endospores go into the grass and then the next cow eats the grass and can get the endospores and then get bacillus anthracis as well it could wipe out a whole farmer's industry and uh, this process of making the endospores is called sporulation. And what happens is that DNA gets nicely packaged in a thick protein coat that is impervious to water, it is impervious to radiation, it is impervious to antibiotics, and can live for virtually thousands of years in a dormant state. So I'm putting some ribosomes in here. And I put in, the, of course, the DNA is in there. And the protein coat, which I did in green. Oh, I'm so sorry, you couldn't see that. There we go. So protein coat, DNA, and ribosomes. The vegetative cell, remember, is purple. Okay, so then the next step is that we get ejection of that endospore. And when the endospore is ejected, then the vegetative cell is destroyed.
So in order for the endospore to thrive, the vegetative cell must die. Okay, the next video we'll be talking about germination and what causes endospores to germinate.